Good morning. It is a great day to know the Lord and to rejoice in God's gifts of grace here at St. Andrew on the fifth Sunday of Epiphany. Welcome to all of you, members and friends alike, and blessings to you in uh, your worship uh, on this Lord's Day. Uh, we invite you to join us for uh, refreshments and fellowship out in the commons after our uh, service today. And if we can serve you more personally through St. Andrew's life and ministry, uh, we invite you to communicate with us using the contact cards in front of you and the pew racks and passing them to uh, the hands of our ushers or into the offering plate later on in the service. We welcome those who are joining us via live stream and invite you to contact us uh, also through our uh, website. Uh, if your plans take you away from St. Andrew on Sunday, remember that we worship on Monday evening, each week at seven o'clock with a celebration of Holy Communion, and uh, on Friday evening at a bilingual service in Amharic and English at 7.30 in the Wellspring uh, Center. A few announcements for the good of the community. Uh, Common Ground is now on hiatus for uh, one week and then until uh, after Easter. Uh, we thank those who uh, have attended. Uh, but we are now turning our attention to the season of Lent, uh, which begins on Wednesday the 14th. Before that, it is the Shrove Tuesday Annual Pancake Supper uh, on the 13th. Information about that in uh, your blue notes. Be sure to put it on your calendars and then join us as we enter the time of Lent uh, with Ash Wednesday services at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, both including the imposition of ashes and the celebration of Holy Communion. And then after Ash Wednesday, uh, there will be midweek Lenten services each week, soup suppers preceding uh, them, and uh, especially put on your calendar the 28th of February when we will welcome uh, the St. Paul Lutheran High School Choir uh, who will support our worship and uh, we thank uh, those of you who will be hosting uh, members of the choir on that day as well. Uh, February is Black History Month. Our bridge builders have provided a, uh, an appropriate display which will change throughout the week, so please uh, check that out uh, in the commons. Also next uh, Sunday, uh, we will be welcoming new members into our church family, so be sure to be here and be part of that uh, welcoming as well. If you would like a blessing for healing of body, mind, or spirit in your life, our healing ministry is available to you today. After you receive the Lord's Supper, just make your way to the back of the sanctuary where that uh, blessing will take place. A few weeks ago, uh, we gave thanks uh, for Leroy Norum celebrating his 102nd birthday. Didn't know this, we have another 102. Her name is Jean Roxon, and so we give thanks for her today and celebrate a uh, hundred and two years. Bob, just think, you got 20 more to go before you, you, you reach that. I mean, it's just kind of an amazing thing. Uh, so we give thanks uh, for Jean and uh, uh, for all the ways God adds uh, years to life and life to our years as well. Blessings to you and your worship on this Lord's Day and in all of your life as we now rise for the order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you, against one another, and have failed to love you above all else. We store up treasures for ourselves and turn away from our neighbors in need. Forgive us that we may live in the freedom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the strength of those who hope in you, be present and hear our prayers. And because in the weakness of our mortal nature we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace so that in keeping your commandments we may please you in will and deed. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the word of the Lord. And the first lesson for this day is written in the prophecy of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning at the 21st verse, and is read today by John Moser. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and to make the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem talk, taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them, they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who, has cr who created these? He who brings out the host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, is understanding and unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint.
The second lesson is written in the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. And it is read this morning by Jane Redeker. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with, all, with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. We honor the Lord by rising to sing the doxology. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed by demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we now sing together the hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you believe that we are already through the first month of this new year? Uh, It feels like just the other day I was up here telling you about all we had to look forward to in this new year, and yet here we are already one month down. Uh, In case you were wondering, 331 days left in the year. Not that I'm counting or anything like that. But uh, with that thought in mind, I thought I would begin this morning by asking perhaps the burning question that is on some of your hearts and minds this morning. How are those New Year's resolutions coming? We're right after the one month mark here and usually that's a good time to reflect on how that first month has gone. And if you are someone who is keeping up with your resolutions, I want to say a big word of congratulations because you are what we like to call an exception. And if you are someone who has not kept up with your resolutions, well then, welcome to the club. There's room for everyone here. See, it may not surprise you uh, that there has been extensive amount of research done on New Year's resolutions and why people make them, how they're able to keep up with them, or why they don't keep up with them. And uh, over the last week or so, I started to dig into some of this research, and I found two things that I thought would be interesting to share with you this morning. The first one is this. Uh, Roughly 80% of people give up on their resolutions by early to mid-February. And part of what the research shows here is that uh, people give up for a plethora of reasons, uh, some of them being they either took on too much stuff at once or uh, they tried to do too many new things at one time. Or uh, another part of this and another reason why people give up is because uh, they took on a resolution that doesn't have some sort of immediate gratification. And so uh, when they're not seeing the results coming to fruition, especially after around a month or so, they just decide that, well, perhaps this one isn't going to work out. And that kind of got me thinking, well, if that's the case, what are the more common resolutions? Why are people giving up and and how are those two things correlated? And so I found the the top five most common resolutions in an article by Forbes. The top five are this in order. Improved fitness, improved finances, improved mental health, losing weight, and improved diet. Now, uh, of those five, I'm pretty sure none of them really surprise any of us because at the beginning of a new year, it makes sense that at least, you know, three of the five are related to health in some way, shape, or form. Everyone's kind of pressing the reset button after all the holiday joy and celebration. And so, uh, interestingly, that kind of makes out this list here. But after just one month, people generally decide that they're not seeing this progress that they thought they were going to see, and so they kind of slowly, gradually let it fade until eventually they just completely stop. And for me, this is where the research starts to tell a bit of a larger story, Uh, not only about our resolve for resolution, but perhaps even more significantly, our lack of patience when we don't see the result of the thing that we are doing. And if there's one area that This really stands out to me and connects directly to our faith. It happens to be what we're going to talk about this morning, the act of prayer. Now, real quick, I just want to take kind of an informal poll here, but uh, if you can, uh, raise your hand if you have ever believed that you prayed and your prayer was not answered according to when you wanted it. Yeah, yeah, for those of you looking around the room, even if you didn't raise your hand, we all know the answer is yes, right? All of us have at one point or another said a prayer and hoped that it would be answered according to when we wanted, and it wasn't. We've shared in that experience of prayers that feel like they are going consistently unanswered. And over time, that can not only feel disheartening, but it feels downright hopeless. And on top of that, in our world today, uh, this has also become a reason for people to uh, take light of prayer. They, they kind of say that, that prayer isn't actually taking action. Now, this is why even when you say to someone, well, I'll pray for you, some people are like, well, but what is that actually going to do? Does that even matter? And, and has God answered every one of your prayers? Because if he hasn't, well, then what is this prayer actually going to change? In our world, uh, people feel like prayer isn't taking action. It's more of like a, a passive thought that actually excuses people from having to take action. And again, as people who have had the experience of prayers go unanswered, perhaps long-standing prayers go unanswered, that feeling begins to weigh on us, and it perhaps begins to grow on us as well. That the feeling of having prayers unanswered or not heard, or not seeing the result of our prayer, can be very disheartening, and ultimately question about why we pray in the first place. 
But that's why the story from Mark's gospel that we heard this morning is so important for us to hear again today. Because in this story, we're reminded that prayer is one of the most powerful and transformative things that we can do as followers of Jesus. And you have to keep in mind that when it comes to prayer, God's answers to our prayers isn't always something that we are going to see, but that doesn't mean it's not working. Because we have a God of grace and of mercy and of truth and of love. A God who promises to hear our prayers always and answer them according to his good and gracious will. So when we pray to God, it's not necessarily about the results that we see, but rather about the trust and the faith we have that God is faithful to his word. That God is faithful to his promises as he always has been and as he always will be. And so in this story, we actually see Jesus teaching us three things about prayer. And and we're going to walk through all three of them and see kind of how they tie together. So uh, the first thing that Jesus teaches us about prayer is that no prayer is too big or too small for God. So if you start uh, where the story begins, Jesus had just recently been preaching and teaching in some synagogues. He'd done some healing of people, and finally the disciples kind of pull him away. And when they do, they tell him that one of the disciples' mother-in-laws is sick at home with a fever. Now, uh, what's interesting about this is we're not really told that they were praying about it, but my guess is that they were. And partially because when we look at the scripture, it says that as soon as they left, they all told Jesus about this immediately. That this was so important that Simon and Andrew and James and John, all of them together were collectively telling Jesus about Simon's mother-in-law. That they cared that this was an important need that they needed him to come and care for. They took him away from what was going on out there just to heal this woman of her fever. And so uh, Jesus responds to that collective need here, and you hear that in verse 31. It says, he came and took her by the hand, and he lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Now, if you had a fever today, would you wake up and your first response be, oh man, Lord, please take this fever away from me? Or maybe would you think to yourself, hmm, I guess I should have some Tylenol or Advil, or uh, in the world in which we live today, Maybe I need to go ahead and find one of those COVID tests lying around the cupboard. Or perhaps you think to yourself, ah, it's a small fever, I'll be fine, I just got to keep on going with the day. And the truth is, none of those responses are wrong or sinful in any kind of way. My guess is, though, if you woke up with a fever, you probably wouldn't feel like it was such a big deal. In fact, I can almost guarantee that you wouldn't think of calling the church office and saying, someone tell the pastors, I have a fever. And part of the reason I know this is because I've heard the stories of people who go into the hospital, come out of the hospital, and they call the pastors after the fact. So I get it. You probably wouldn't call us about the fever that you woke up with. And honestly, that's okay. But I do hope that perhaps you are talking to God about it. Because one of the things that I've heard a wise pastor say is, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And we see this here with the disciples. That Jesus is is caring for even just the smallest of needs. That he's caring for Simon's mother-in-law who has a simple fever. Right after he was healing people in all kinds of ways. Jesus cares about every single need that we have. And therefore we should take everything we have to him in prayer. That God cares about every prayer no matter how big or how small. And he may not answer it immediately like he did in this story or perhaps how he does in your past. But his promise is that he is always listening and he will answer. He cares about your every need. and He wants you to know that nothing is too small for him. And nothing is too big. He can handle everything and he wants you to lift it up before him in prayer. And when you do that, when you lift those things up in prayer, you begin to watch as your trust in him continues to grow. And this kind of takes us to the second thing that Jesus is teaching us then. Uh, Prayer is an intentional act of faith. See, after Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, word gets out about what he's doing. And all of a sudden, people are coming from all around the city to ask Jesus to heal their, their friends, their family, whoever it is. And so you hear that Jesus is healing people of all kinds of illnesses, and he's casting out demons. And in fact, Scripture tells us the whole city gathers at this house to watch as Jesus is healing person after person after person. 
And after doing all of that healing, Jesus and hopefully everyone else leaves, and Jesus kind of takes a step back and he rests. And then you hear something very specific that Jesus goes and does. In verse 35, we're told, In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. I want to point out something here quickly that I know I've said before and you all know is true that you can pray anywhere at any time about anything. Our prayer life is not limited to a certain place or space. And at the same time, something that we have to recognize is that if part of our calling, part of our faith is to follow Jesus and do the things that he did, perhaps that includes our prayer life. It includes following the model that Jesus is setting here before us. Jesus sets intentional time aside for prayer. In fact, in numerous places in the various Gospels, we are told of how Jesus takes a step back from everyone and everything. He separates himself. He goes to a place of solitude, and he spends time in prayer. Now, if you're like me, when you hear this, perhaps one of the things you're thinking to yourself is, I don't have time to add anything else to my schedule. In fact, I barely have time to do the things that are already on my schedule, much less add another thing. And at the same time, personally speaking anyway, when I look at how my day goes or the time that I do have, what I realize is I'm ultimately just making choices about how I spend my time. Because if I took the time that I spend on social media or uh, scrolling through the internet or one episode of Netflix, 20 or 40 minutes, that's quite a bit of time that I can choose to take back. And yet, I don't. Right? So ultimately, the reality is uh, my prayer life is not about the amount of time that I don't have. It's about how I'm choosing to spend that time. And in this case, I'm choosing not to spend it with God. And this is kind of a, a convicting reality because none of the things that I'm doing are inherently sinful, but they are choices that I'm making not to spend that time with God. And so when I reconcile that, when I feel guilty about that or, or, or feel embarrassed by that, I can actually do the thing Jesus is inviting me to do. I can pray about it. Because when I go to God, when I, when I tell him that I am embarrassed about the time I haven't spent with him and I want to spend more time with him, God meets me in that prayer. That God covers me with his mercy and his forgiveness and his grace. And he promises that he is still listening. That he knows what's on my heart and on my mind. That he is ready to answer the prayers that I lift up before him. That he is always waiting to spend that time with me. And so when I see Jesus praying here, I realize he's inviting me simply to see that I have a choice to make. I have a choice to, to choose to spend that time with God. To make intentional time. Set apart from everything else going on in the world. And to spend those moments with God. And all it takes is one moment to change everything. And the same is true for you. That you have this opportunity to, to, to make this choice that whether you have already set aside time or perhaps you're doing it for the first time, God is ready to hear your prayers. God already knows what's on your heart and on your mind. And so part of this experience is communicating with him to experience his presence within you. To know that you have a God who's always ready to meet you in your prayers. Who wants you to share your cares or concerns with him at all times, and who wants you to make time for him in the midst of all you have going on in your life. Because a part of this reality for us is that we realize when we pray, prayer is not some sort of self-righteous obligation, but rather prayer is how we experience life-giving transformation. And this kind of leads us to the, the third thing that Jesus is teaching us about prayer. Prayer refills our spirit. See, if you look at this story here, there are so many things happening all at once, and they all happen in a very specific way and even in a specific order. Jesus starts off by preaching and teaching in the synagogue, and then he's pulled to go and heal Simon's mother-in-law, and then after doing that, he heals all these other people, casting out demon after demon, and then finally he gets a chance to go and rest and spend some time in prayer. And one of the things I realized when I look at this story is that I can't imagine how exhausted Jesus must have been from spending all that time with all those people, all those hours, that long, long day. Jesus must have been tired. 
And in fact, we, we know that just because Jesus was tired, it doesn't somehow limit his power in any way, but just simply speaks to the reality that as he was both God and man, Jesus experienced the exhaustion that we all experience after a long day. And what I think is being highlighted for us here is that not only was Jesus' body tired, but his spirit was tired too. That in the same way we can be tired after a long day, or after dealing with with all the the stuff that we have going on in our lives. The reality is that it doesn't ever feel like stuff goes away. It feels like just new stuff gets added on. And after a while, you just begin to feel like you have so much stuff going on, and whether you've ever said it out loud before, or you just feel it in your heart, you come to this place where you say to yourself, I don't really have anything else to give. And when you come to that moment, Jesus invites you to take it back to him. Jesus invites you to pray about it. Because the reality is when your spirit is in need, Jesus is ready to fill you back up. And when you have so much going on in life, sometimes prayer is the only thing that you can do. And my guess is you've had those moments in your life before. That when when you have come to some of the hardest moments in life, when, when life feels like it's at a breaking point, or when you're, you're walking through an illness with a loved one, or when you're mourning the death of a loved one. When you come to the moment when there's nothing else that you can do but pray, you're reminded that Jesus meets you in that prayer. That Jesus is not only inviting your spirit to rest, but he is pouring back into your spirit. He is filling you back up to face whatever the next day may bring. That there is rest found when our spirit is in need and when we give it to God, he answers our prayers. And this is something that we have learned and been doing from the time that we first learned about prayer. Because prayer is an intentional act of faith. It's a reminder that there is nothing too big or too small for our God. And every time we pray, we are reminded of the promise that God meets us in our prayer, that he is always listening to us, that he cares for everything that you have to take before him, and he is always pouring his goodness back out upon you. As I close uh, this morning, I thought perhaps it would be fitting to, to do the thing that we're talking about, to pray together. And I want to pray a prayer with you that I guess I've prayed before, but I never knew it had a name up until recently. Uh, It's called the I Don't Know Prayer. And the name is about as straightforward as it gets. So I invite you to pray with me now. Lord God, I don't know. I don't know where to go from here. I don't know what is happening or what is going to happen. I don't know how to process this. I don't know why I'm going through this. I don't know what to do with all of these emotions. I don't know how to handle the situation. But you know. Let that be enough for me today, tomorrow, and every day still to come. You know, O Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue in worship, I invite you to stand as you are able. Join me now as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Walking in Christ, the light of the world, let us turn our hearts to God in prayer. With hearts filled with gratitude for blessings given and received, we pray, O God, for a spirit of unity and of peace in your church and throughout the world. 
that all people everywhere would be transformed into reflections of your glorious light in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you give power to the faint and strength to those who are weak. Bring healing to the suffering and the brokenhearted. And hear us as we pray for Boots Like a Bush, David Heineman, Nancy Lim, Clement Thomas, Bob Everly, Marvin Best, Patty Zimmerman, Cliff Massacoy, Johnny Smith, Bridget Kearney, all who we name in the secrets of our hearts and all who are in need throughout the human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the family of Marty Lukey and Adrian Evans, who have received their rest in Christ, that the sure and certain promises by which they lived will comfort all who mourn and encourage our earthly days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace in every land and for all innocent victims of war and terror, for those who serve in the armed forces of our country, for family members who watch and wait, and especially for those who are injured and those who mourn the loss of loved ones, and that all forces that would diminish freedom and human life in our nation and throughout the world would be rendered powerless. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our nation celebrates Black History Month, Make us truly grateful celebrants of the variety of races and cultures which you have created in your image, that as sisters and brothers of Christ, we may be agents of justice, unity, and harmony within your great diversity of gifts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the ministry of our congregation, which you love, and for all who strengthen it with their faithful worship, consecrated service, and sacrificial offerings, that by your grace, we may walk together to bring the good news and the caring touch of your beloved son into our communities and throughout the world. And for our sister, Jean Roxon, with thanksgiving for her 102nd birthday and her ongoing life in witness to your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we rejoice now and always. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. We worship the Lord with our tithes and Sunday offerings. You may be seated.
God is in this place and comes to us at the table of his son as I now invite you to rise as we continue with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings of creation and above all for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Because he has now risen from the dead, all who believe in him will overcome death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night before he gave his life for us, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Taught by our Lord, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace to the day of everlasting life. Amen. We rise for prayer. O oh God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. Strengthen us to love you with all our heart, serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace, amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.